Welcome. I'm Catherine Martineau, and I'm assistant professor in Asian and Asian American studies at Binghamton University, and I welcome you to the series Mediating Justice. Um, this series, um, which will take place uh, in February and March with a concluding event in early April, um, brings together anthropologists and peace scholars to discuss how ideas of justice thrive in particular contexts, inspired by recent events that have demonstrated again how complex yet urgent justice is as a concept from the systematic inequalities exposed by COVID-19 deaths to widespread social mobilization against racist police violence, we turn not to philosophy or jurisprudence, but to the institutions and interactions that enact ideas of justice. We ask, how do everyday practices reflect, reproduce, and change prevailing approaches to justice? Rather than seeking a universal definition of justice, this panel explores how concepts of justice are mediated by the interactions, institutions, and conditions of their use. The series seeks to expand our understanding of how justice works, including how it might work as a normative goal for justice-seeking scholarship. And I'm joined today by um, Dr. Justin De Leon. Um, Justin, Dr. Justin De Leon is a visiting assistant professor at the Kroc Institute for International Relations. I'm sorry, International Peace Studies at Notre Dame. He earned his PhD in International Relations with a focus on gender and women's studies and Native American studies at the University of Delaware. He's currently on the editorial board of the International Feminist Journal of Politics. I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. De Leon with us today. Dr. De Leon's research is forging an indigenous approach to studying creative claims to security and sovereignty through film and storytelling. And he explores how entanglements uh, with tradition and culture of the Lakota Sioux of South Dakota and their continued challenge to and navigation of settler colonial orders acts as a correction to historical and present day marginalizations. He's currently writing a book manuscript exploring creative approaches to sovereignty that focuses on traditional Native American storytelling expressed in contemporary film and media. And Dr. Laura Kunruther. Dr. Kunruther is an associate professor of anthropology at Bard College. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Michigan. And her first book, Voicing Subjects, Public Intimacy and Mediation in Kathmandu, traces the relationship between public speech and notions of personal interiority during a moment of political upheaval in Nepal. Her current book project is called Interpreting the Field on the Labor of Interpreters for UN Missions, and it explores the work of United, United Nations field interpreters whose labor goes largely unnoticed but is essential to this global organization. Um, interpreting the field explores historical and cultural connections between the invisibility of interpreters' labor and the bureaucratic ideals of transparency and global citizenship. So thank you both for joining us today. We would also like to acknowledge that our work with the Kroc Institute for Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame takes place on the ancestral homelands of the Pokagon Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, and um, now today, um, we'll begin with a kind of open-ended conversation. Um, and I will pose a question to both of our participants and then provide an opportunity for you both to respond to it and then we'll open to a more uh, general conversation. So my question for you both is, what is the role of justice in your work? And how does justice operate as a focus of study and as a concept for the communities and individuals whom you work with? How do questions of justice shape your methods and your research practice? Thank you. And I will begin with Laura. Laura? Thank you. Thanks uh, so much, Kate, for that great introduction. And um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this um, exciting panel of speakers. Um, so um, 
I also want to thank you just for the prompts because it got me thinking in ways that were really implicit in my work and you're sort of getting me to think more explicitly um, about, about justice uh, as, a, as a central um, node around which work, my work focuses. Um, as, as you introduced, my, my research right now is focused on uh, interpreters, which are oral translators, um, who stand in the middle between uh, global organizations um, focusing particularly on human rights and humanitarian organizations and local communities. Um, so they serve as a bridge between the local community and global organizations. And therefore, they are crucial to realizing the global ambitions of any of these organizations like the UN. And most of the missions that I'm looking at are, um, are around the UN, but it's interpreters frequently move between organizations, as you can imagine. Um, so in contrast to sort of the professional simultaneous interpreters um, the, who are working in the halls of the UN General Assembly, who are rigorously trained and they have, you know, 20 minute breaks and they have acoustically engineered space and they have a network of other interpreters who are coming in. Field interpreters describe their work as a kind of constant movement between um, in the field, often through dangerous territory um, and in compromised acoustic setting that makes their work very hard. Um, and also with very little rest and often without training or very little training. Um, so one of the interpreters that I spoke to in, who worked for a while at the OHCHR, which is the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights in Nepal when they had a big mission there, um, described how he had been poked uh, on the shoulder and he put his finger onto my shoulder to show me and said that his client, as he called him, said to him, translate. Um, and he replied to me, you know, I'm not an ATM machine. I'm not a vending machine. I'm not a computer. I'm human. And so much of this work is in, embattled with the question of unsettling their own sense of humanity. Um, so um, justice in my work, it falls along three different um, angles. One is the uh, kind of day-to-day -day work within a global bureaucracy. So justice and the, and the dignity of work, um, which dovetails with, with literature on, on invisible labor, um, particularly among culture brokers. This is not always professionalized work, therefore they're not always protected in particular ways. Um, I'm also interested in thinking about the overall budgets of these huge humanitarian organizations and where do interpreters who actually make their work possible fit in within the budgetary scheme. Uh, on a second level, justice is often the central substance of the work that these organizations are engaged in. And at least in the human rights uh, organizations like the OHCHR, um, they are working within a frame of international law and a frame of thinking about justice from what I would call a kind of narrow legal uh, framework. Um, and so the interpreters are necessarily the mediators of justice as you're the title of this series is um, is noting because they are translating the information and testimony that later becomes the substance of human rights reports. Um, and then at a third level, and this is addressing your, your third question, um, the question of justice and ethics is inflects my re research methodology. And um, by this, I mean, um, you know, how do we think about a research design and knowledge production among a group of people who are themselves knowledge producers in a way, um, and particularly vulnerable often, people who are often targets of attack, 
um, who are questioned as and their loyalty is often questioned. Are they traitors? Um, in one setting that I'm looking at where there are refugee interpreters, um, they're often, um, it's a question of whether they are taking bribes, whether they're changing testimony, so that research with interpreters is fraught with ethical issues. Um, and I try to address this both by um, thinking about publication and aside from the normal um, anthropological, um, ha you know, con the normal anthropological uh, precursor of, of keeping confidentiality and, and identity. I'm also trying to think about talking to people who are perhaps have been involved in this work but are not currently, um, and so that they are not put under any undue threat, as well as thinking of them as research collaborators. And in some cases, I've actually published things together with them. Um, recently, I had a, a publication that's coming out that's a, a collective of me and interpreters writing together. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there and we can talk more. Thank you. And Justin, I invite you to share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And um, thank you, Laura. I, I appreciate the, uh, the land recognition um, for me that really points to this relationship of responsibility that we have and uh, an invitation to explore what that responsibility looks like and also it should be evoking action. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to the Great Plains. That's where I do a lot of my work. Uh, South Dakota and North Dakota, you have these sort of rolling hills where um, while you're driving, you could see pheasant running through, you could see antelope. Uh, it's very, very remote. And I remember this time uh, in 2016 when I was going back and forth that President Obama, he was the first standing president to visit uh, native country, as they call it, um, as a standing president. And he went to this small little community of Cannonball, which was on the Standing Rock Reservation near also uh, South Dakota, but it was in North Dakota. And I remember this being a very celebrated uh, visit. The whole community of, of all the Lakota, North and South Dakota and beyond even Minnesota came to celebrate uh, this visibility they had never had before. And President Obama, as gracious as he ever is, um, came and spent the whole day meeting with young people, meeting with the youth, meeting with elders, visiting the community center. And this is a tiny, tiny community, very, very small. I was in the area, I didn't have tickets to go in, but I was on the outskirts with a handful of, uh, you would call them water protectors who were actually uh, trying to raise awareness um, about the Keystone pipeline at the point, not the Dakota Access at that point. And all these beautiful things happened and, and it was a really wonderful day. And I recall reflecting upon that day um, a few weeks later with some friends. I remember having this conversation where this young woman, a uh, young mother was reflecting on the beautiful things that President Obama was saying. And she was, she was noticeably shaken. She was, her voice was trembling. And she said that President Obama stood in front of her people and said, no matter where you live in the United States, whether it's on reservation or in a city, everyone should have access to the American dream. Everyone should be able to flourish in this United States of America. And she was still trembling in her delivery. And then she looked at me and almost tears in her eyes. She said, what if I don't want that American dream? What if I look at that flag and every time I see the red, I see the spilled blood, the unrecognized spilled blood of my ancestors? What if I don't want a world of missing and murdered indigenous women, of having to work three or four jobs just to make ends meet, of going to the local hockey professional 
game and, and having our children being rated by prejudiced and racist remarks. Then she said, what if I want a world of community? What if I want a world of compassion? What if I want a world of family, care? So I break up that story because I think it points to two ways of how I would understand justice in work. One of them, and you can sort of draw from this incredible work of Eve Tuck in 2009, she wrote an article called Suspending Damage. One of them can loosely be sort of looked at as, uh, you know, being treated fairly, working to trying to be treated equitably. Uh, as our friend would say, like, you know, the, having to work multiple jobs and being um, exploited for every ounce of what you are for missing and murdered indigenous women. That's one thing. And, and it could loosely align with damage based research, as Eve Tuck would say. And then the other one, I would say, so that's on one angle. And the other angle, I would say, thinking anew, thinking about something new, or for my personal belief system, this notion of, uh, um, um, being with your own eyes, right? Being able to shed dogma as a part of justice. So I think in that story, not only are we talking about the realities in which indigenous people face, missing and murdered, high rates of criminality, constructed criminality, um, little, if any, political voice on one side. And on the other side, you see this looking to something new, this shedding of dogma, the shedding of institutional structures that don't always make sense, looking to compassion, love, uh, community, and the like. And I have to say, so I am an ethnographer, and, and that means that a lot of the spaces that I work in, obviously, they're mediated. The data is, data is mediated through who I am. So it's important for me to tell you who I am. So my name is Justin. De Leon. I'm, um, I'm a Filipino American. My family comes from an indigenous region of the Philippines and we make our home here in the United States. I'm speaking to you today on Ohlone territory, but I work on Okay territory. And at the heart of what I do is trying to figure out how can I be both a product of colonialism, a racialized body, while at the same time produce some of those same colonial uh, forces of violence and, and replicate some of those same forces of erasure. And that's at the heart of what I do. I'm also a Baha'i, and Baha'i, the Baha'i faith is a world religion that uh, there is a lot of indigenous people that are part of. And in the in Canada, in the 60s and 70s, it was um, estimated that one third to one half of all uh, enrolled Baha'is were First Nations uh, peoples. So there's this kinship, and that's where I come to how do I understand this notion of justice. So I'll just highlight those two elements again. One is, uh, a working towards fair treatment through the avenues of sovereignty, through the avenues of uh, judicial um, battles and, and, and cultural battles and so on and so forth. And then the other one is seeing with your own eyes, envisioning a new world, uh, not inheriting and taking what we inherited, that dogma as truth. Those are the two things I would mention. Lastly, turning just really briefly to my own research, so I work around the concept of security and also sovereignty. And I really use these spaces to try to point out these two elements of justice. One is how do we use security discourse and sovereignty discourse to make more space, right? To, in a sense, get that boot off one's throat. And then the other side, once that boot is off the throat, how do we envision something new, something beyond the discourses that we currently inherit? right, dealing with this notion of incommensurability. So I'll just point to some research that I'm doing with uh, Matt Wildcat, who's a professor at University of Alberta, and we're looking at sovereignty. And sovereignty in international relations largely is uncontested as a term, right, as a term. Certainly, uh, sovereignty as a practice is contested. Whose border is this? Where do one state start? Where does the other state end? So on and so forth. But in terms of the the, the concept is relatively um, unchallenged. However, if you look at indigenous engagement with sovereignty, that's not the case. So here's a list of qualified sovereignties that indigenous scholars have put up. Rhetorical sovereignty, settler sovereignty, double bind of sovereignty, 
third space of sovereignty, nested sovereignty, sovereignty of the soul, erotics of sovereignty, temporal sovereignties, intellectual sovereignty, visual sovereignty, network sovereignty. So what we say is that sovereignty exists in this space of what is, which is in a sense this way, it's damage and what doesn't work. And what can be, which in a, another sense that other elements of justice is shedding dogma and looking anew, right? So there's all these concepts where indigenous peoples fall right into my understanding of justice, which is how do we critique the system, right? And create equitable, breathable spaces. And then how do we look somewhere new that's based on community, care, compassion, and something that we don't even know we're working towards. You know, thank you so much for sharing what this, um how this inflects your own work. Um, I would love to hear how you both came to this project out of an interest in justice. Um, and we might take a few minutes and then I'd really like to sh spend a couple of minutes asking you to reflect, I wanna save time for this, um, on the role of both of you work on media forms. You know, Laura's book was on radio uh, and Justin, you work a lot on film. And, and I'm really interested, both of you think a lot about the form uh, of aesthetic form and sensory form. And I'm wondering how those forms might come into um, justice as well. So if, uh, I'll open it up to both of you then. Laura, would you like to go first? Um, sure. Um, yeah, thank you also Justin for such a beautiful story and sharing your work. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I think there are interesting parallels in our work in just thinking about um, treatment of just fair treatment in work um, in general or in life as it is more expansive for in Justin's case. Um, and so I guess um, in terms of answering the question about um, how I came to this work, um, it, it, it was one of those um, typical sort of ethnographic adventures where I was finishing work for my first book and um, I met several people, I was in Nepal and I met several people who, had, who were employed um, by the, uh, the UN mission in Nepal. And um, it, it started there where somebody, one of the people who was head of the translation unit sort of described his work as being a voice for hire. And I realized I was talking about the mediation of voice through radio and through, and, and kind of through democratic discourse. Um, and I had never really thought about the role of these people who were hired to be the voice for everyone but themselves. And in an odd way, um, part of what he was, it made me think that part of what he was saying paralleled some of the work that radios do. Um, that, you know, in some sense, and, and as I've described in some, in one of my recent publications, these people describe themselves as being conduits. So I became interested in thinking about, you know, what does it mean um, to be a medium? What does it mean to, to basically uh, be a human being whose sole uh, work was uh, being a, a mediating force. Um, so in some ways that begins to get a little bit at, at what you had asked as your as second question. Um, so I see this tension between interpreters being these conduits of voice, which is one ethical pers perspective because they must be neutral, impartial, and basically not uh, put any of their own ideas into the words that they're speaking. But they're also, as I've been calling them, ear witnesses. Um, and by that, I mean, um, in their work as listeners, uh, they have a ethical and subjective responsibility to accurately convey information, some of which may not be said to them. Um, and some of which, you know, very intensely affects their own subjectivity and their own body. 
Um, so some of the people that I have talked to got out of this work in part because they had a kind of breakdown of their, of their bodies. Um, and uh, so I can talk more. Uh, maybe Justin wants to answer this first question. We can certainly talk more about the mediating qualities because there's a lot more to say about that. Um, but maybe I should stop and, and let Justin answer now. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Uh, I had worked in global development for about six or seven years prior to going to graduate school, and I was trying to understand some of the root causes of injustice, of violence, of poverty, and so on. And everywhere I looked, the elephant in the room was always this structure, this, this, this structure of colonialism, whether it's settler or um, post-colonialism. And I knew that it felt like everything that I was doing was sort of putting band-aids on uh, a much larger issue rather than actually addressing the issue. So I decided to um, shift careers. Uh, I had been actually war, uh, around youth and media around uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, East Africa, and so on. And I realized I wanted to be in a space where um, thought is being created in the first place to really think about how can we um, challenge some of these structures of colonialism, patriarchy, and so on and so forth that are causing the outcomes in which so many of us are dedicating our lives to solve. And so that's how I situated myself where I am. Uh, having um, a background like I do, I naturally gravitated towards um, looking at uh, experience of marginal populations in the United States. And I realized that in order to really uh, carry out the interrogation and the intervention that I want to, it makes sense to really look at indigenous peoples in the United States, or as um, Audrey Lord would say, the belly of the beast, right? If in fact I'm looking at these structures of oppression and the United States has certainly played a role in those globally, then it makes sense to try to look inside, to really um, urge on this sort of uh, reflection of what is this American project. Uh, if it's not inclusive, what is it? So that's how I come to this type of work. Um, I would highlight that uh, I believe and what motivates my work and what I see is that justice is a spiritual truth that for a lot of indigenous people I work with, the spiritual truth of unity is operationalized through justice and balance. Uh, and so in this way, it's not just a, a sort of a feel good exercise to make sure other people are, uh, you know, have their own allotments, so to speak, but it's actually a spiritual truth that we're all made of the same cosmic dust. And if that's the case, right, how do we live that out? How do we move into a space where we're all interconnected or, um, you know, the Lakota have a phrase, mitakyo oyasin, which means all my relatives, all my relations. Um, the native Hawaiians have this term Aya, and all of those point to this notion that we're all from the same cosmic dust, that unity is the, 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 the binding principle which justice helps animate. Um, so in, in moving towards thinking about medium, uh, so I love music, like many of us do. I love jazz music, I love classical music, but I could say that that music, but I necessarily love the piano. That is to say that I look at film and filmmaking as a way to be a conduit for um, individual and community expression, sort of foregrounding this gift of utterance, these speech acts, again, which are also uh, spiritual acts. Um, we know that a lot of the communities that we work with are oral history based communities. And the reason why now my methodology is really turned towards narrative and story is because I think as a methodology, story can offer us so much that say for instance, uh, other types of um, say variable analysis cannot, right? Which is if we fully believe that the world is intersectional in its uh, sort of current of oppression and, and, and how one navigates the world, a variable that may tell you your ethnic background, your gender, or whatever, can't really capture some of that imbricated and intersectional nuance that um, that the interpreters, that that 
uh, Laura works with that, that the, the young women that I work with find themselves in. So one thing that's really beautiful about story is that it can really uplift human soul in ways that we don't fully recognize how. When you sit in front of a beautiful TED talk or you go and you see even a beautiful film, sometimes it resonates with you in ways that you can't even articulate. That's the power of creativity, that it speaks to a higher nature of oneself where those words that we've trained for years and years and years to try to get, we can't fully capture. Right? It's almost as the, the Moors used to say, and now the soccer fans, when they say, ole, 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 and it used to be, you know, Allah, Allah, Allah. They used to see the divinity in the dancers and in the, the movements of people, and they call it what it is. When one tells a story, there's all sorts of people they can bring into the room that defy capturing or being captured in a single variable. So for me, what story does is it allows for complexity. It allows for nuance and resistance. It allows for all the different levels of what we understand ourselves to be. For me, that's mind, body, and soul, and heart. That's not just mind. One of the examples of how this manifests itself is this, uh, this coming year, later this year, I'm directing what we're calling this Creative Sovereignty Lab. And it's in partnership with this film, this upcoming film, this coming film that's uh, called Tanea. And it's about this young black woman who finds out she's also native and tries to figure out that, that complexity of dual identity. We recently won a script award from the Toronto International Film Festival uh, for the script. And we're pairing together community and native apprentices with professional filmmakers. But we're not just leaving it at that. We're not just saying love this medium because the medium is so great. But we were saying, what can we do and what can we learn about a mode of expression that has not been fully fleshed out in relationship to the values that we bring to the table, that there's a spiritual perception that needs to be catered to, that there's an underlying element of justice that has to be infused with everything, and that there's a spiritual reality that we're all interconnected. Thanks. I I hear you saying that there's, um, Justin, a good deal of emergence involved in your research practice. Um, does that sound right to you? It seems like you're mixing and trying to create conditions in which new forms of creative expression bring justice about and create the grounds for justice, um, which is quite different than many of the ways that lots of other research say on justice or inequality happens, right? And, and I'm really struck, Laura, as you're talking about ear witnessing at what a beautiful concept that is and how it seems actually quite appropriate for what Justin is talking about too, that it places, you know, this work um, with film, for instance, and modes of narrative representation might be taking ear witnessing and making other people ear witnesses, that that's one of the possibilities for kind of engaging with some of this work. So. I, I will just say that um, in terms of this, the, the question of the medium to just elaborate a little bit more, and I think this really does tie into what Justin was saying too, um, you know, for me, the, the issue of the medium, first of all, their voice is the medium and their body is the medium, right? So they themselves are a medium in some sense. And that's part of what I'm looking at. But in, but in particular, with the concept of ear witnessing, um, it's sound, you know, how sound is so crucial to understanding anything, right? For their work in particular. And um, so I have, I have looked at uh, basically the conditions of doing this work by focusing on all the times that people constantly were talking about sound and saying, we don't have, you know, uh, I couldn't hear. One person gave me a story of, talking into somebody's ear and learning after two hours of talking that that person was deaf in that ear. And just in incredulous, like, how could they not tell me this? <laughs> just the idea that you, you know, are spending your time doing this and, and no one ever thought about hearing and sound, which is actually the crucial part of doing this kind of work. 
it is thought about very, very deeply in the halls of the, the General Assembly where they have the best acoustic engineers designing this thing. But in the field and the idea of the field, it's almost a non-issue. So that's one medium. And I'll just say one other thing that I think the pandemic has led to new, new um, forms of, of media research um, that we're all kind of, as ethnographers, discovering. Uh, and one of the things that I have done in the last little bit of time is um, I have some films that this institution that I'm working with in Geneva has created that are fiction, fictional films developed by um, interpreters who are trying to show kind of the complexities of their work. And I've been having these sessions on Zoom where we come and talk about these films. And I don't, I don't really know where this is all going, but it is fascinating in part because using a fictive medium, visual, um, alongside in the Zoom setting, where in some sense, it's, it's actually a lot more intimate than sitting in a hall showing a film because you're actually, you're on the screen together. Um, and I know that that will, that will have a place in whatever I, you know, come up with for this research, yeah. Thanks, Laura, I really, really appreciate. And I think that there's a lot of overlaps in the ways that we're thinking and moving in, in our own research. Uh, I also really appreciate that, that concept of um, emergence, Kate. I think you're absolutely right that in many ways, um, you know, kind of going back to this concept of incommensurability, which is found in a lot of ethnic studies work, which is we're trying to build a world that is different from the world that we're living in with insufficient tools. And how do we do that at the same time, the same project at the same time? Um, the things that I would really point to then would be, you know, I was, I, going back to my original understanding of justice, where in one side we have trying to end oppression, and then on the other side, building something beyond oppression. There's a group of researchers out up north in uh, University of British Columbia and University of Victoria who put together this concept of indigenous resurgence, which is to say, if in fact, we're trying to negotiate with the state for rights. Should we not think about using different mechanisms than state mechanisms? Because the state mechanisms have only brought us this far and they only reinforce state dominance. So what does a world look like that's outside of the state system? Which, you know, that sort of endeavor is, is very to, to your to your point, Kate is is all about emergence. It's about moving into what we don't know. Um, so I would say in that space, there's these really two interesting streams. One of them, in fact, uh, what Laura is mentioning. The first would be those scholars who created indigenous resurgence, then created this university in Yellowknife called the Shinta Bush University, which is exactly that. It's the Bush University. I think it's now called the Shinta Learning Institute. I'm not exactly sure, but all of the lessons are outdoor, land-based, and drawing from traditional knowledge. My assessment of what that is and what that's doing is that when that oppression ends, the settler structure ends, what are we as a, a group of human beings going to have to build upon? And so if we don't look at other ways of building knowledge and, 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 and political affairs and political interactions, then we won't have anything to turn to. I think another element here is called um, what, what some scholars call constructive resilience, which is what's happening in Iran with the Baha'is who in the face of oppression are making a point not to adopt the mannerisms of the oppressor, but to build something beyond. So when that oppression ends, there's something to turn to. Now, that's that one element. And here's the other part that I think meshes with what Laura was mentioning, is that if you look at the literature around futurisms, when you think of futurisms, it's usually in African-American studies, black studies, 
or indigenous studies. And why is that? Well, if you're a group of people who you've had your history tried to been erased physically, but then also sort of conceptually erased, and your presence, your present is currently contested in many different ways, how else can you envision a new future but to use your imagination? And so I'm editing this edited volume that's coming out in a few months around creative sovereignty. And one of the scholars, um, Blair Topash uh, Caldwell, who actually is Pokagan, she writes that um, indigenous sci-fi is more than just a feel-good hobby. It's actually an expression of creative sovereignty. It's a replacing, a re claiming of what the future could look like in spite of attempts to erase presence and past. So in many ways, I would say to what Laura mentioned, this notion of futurisms is very powerful. I almost think of you know, Cynthia Enloe's The Curious Feminist, right? That she says that if we don't have the bravery to think beyond an act of justice, and that's what I would say, not necessarily Cynthia Enloe, but if we're not there to be creative, to think beyond, then what are we going to be mired in? That old. So in many ways, I think that justice animates an indigenous and people of color urge to want to envision something new. And that's why I spend so much time in these spaces because I want something new and I don't know the answer to what that is. And so I'm open to this idea of emergence. I'm open to this idea of creating the conditions in which we can learn to get to that next horizon so that the next generation can get to the horizon and say, oh, look, there's a further horizon down the road. At the same time that you say that, I, I think to um, the point that Laura was bringing up about the experiences of these interpreters and, and that there is a, a cost to being the person who does that labor, right? And that futurism itself is a kind of labor Right. And that there does come a kind of cost exhaustion, you know, any of this mediation work is embodied. And so I love, Laura, how your work is bringing that up, that these people who are doing this imaginative work, whether it's speaking into somebody's ear or it's making films or writing novels, right, that there is a kind of a, a real cost to the body that's doing this. And um, so I, I love that that your work is bringing that up. I, I do recognize that we have <laughs> continued our conversation. I'm loving it. I would love to go on, but I do feel like we should um, bring it to an end. And um, I want to give you both an opportunity to have a closing thoughts or anything else that came up for you at the end, um, either of you. Um. There's a lot to say, I suppose. <laughs> um, I think that this notion of the future and of thinking beyond um, beyond the real, you know, beyond thinking more expansively about what is the real, <laughs> uh, which I think is part of what Justin is pushing us to do. I think there's a real movement within anthropology uh, now to be turning towards, you know, science fiction. I mean, I think this whole pandemic has kind of made a science fiction world a reality in a way. Um, and that, that um, in many ways, uh, expanding our notion of, of what is the empirical um, is part of what I, I feel like new research methodologies in disciplines like that are supposedly grounded in the empirical, like social science research, really needs to go. Um, I mean, I and I think that um, that the merging with more with the humanities and 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 literary ideas of of envisioning um, and emergence is. Uh, is definitely, a, I don't know exactly how it's going to work its way into my work, except through the methods of, you know, engaging with people who are, who are doing this kind of work on their own. Um, so that's, that's one thing I'll say. Um, I could go on to other things, but I'll 
but Justin, go ahead. Uh, in thinking about um, kind of some concluding thoughts, I had mentioned that there's this really big importance on balance. And uh, I recall hearing stories of traditionally Lakota folks would have say a member of family that were killed. And instead of creating punitive systems, they would um, adopt the killer of that family member into their family to regain balance, right? To reestablish balance. Um, and so one of the things I think about is how justice can be seen within this cycle of life of, of decay, um, hibernation, renewal, a new springtime. And so in many ways, uh, I think of the concept of seven generations that's passed around in many indigenous spaces, which is um, seven generations ago, we had uh, ancestors praying for us and thinking about us. And then in our behaviors and our actions and our understanding, what is the empirical in our research, we also have to think about and pray for those seven generations to come from us. That is to say, to, to sort of nest our work around justice in this larger cycle of life. And I think what that sort of uh, necessitates is this realization that we are working for justice and we will work for justice in spite of maybe not being able to see the outcomes of our efforts and still being okay with that because that is the cycle of, of life and of unity and the circle of life that is a law that all of nature, including our political science and our peace studies constructions has to abide by this cyclical uh, cycle of life. So I think ultimately I would just, you know, I, I, I sit here and thinking about closing, I'm, I'm drawn back to the words of my friend who says, you know, what if I don't want um, a world of prejudice, of racism, of missing and murdered indigenous women or working X amount of jobs, what if I want a world of community? What if I want a world of care or love? And I think that justice has to have a punitive aspect and a sort of getting the boot off of one's throat, but it also necessitates us to think about what happens next. Thank you, both of you. Thank you for joining us. Um, this has been a really wonderful conversation. I wish it could go on. I would love to be at a conference with both of you, and I hope that can happen at some point in the future. And I will look forward to all the work that you've been sharing with us. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, I'd also really like to thank the Croc Institute for their support, especially the director of Croc, Asher Kaufman, communications director, Hannah Heinziker, and events manager, Lisa Gallagher. Thank you, Lisa. And that's it. Thanks very much. Um, and look toward, for our other events that are happening throughout February, March, and early April. Thanks so much for everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.